Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center here at Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. We're here today. This is a very uh, special day for uh, us at Hudson Institute and, and in particular for uh, the uh, director of our Center for Global Prosperity, uh, Carol Edelman. Uh, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're here to celebrate uh, the extraordinary work that uh, she has done here at Hudson Institute, and in particular, the extraordinary work of the uh, Index of Global Philanthropy which and Remittances, which has done so much to uh, increase knowledge around the world of the importance of uh, private international development assistance, of the crucial role that it plays, of public-private partnerships, and also the uh, Index of Philanthropic Freedom, which uh, does so much to uh, inform policymakers around the globe uh, about ways in which uh, they can do more to increase uh, philanthropy in their home countries. Uh, these, both of these products have been signature products of Hudson Institute, and today we are proud to send these children of Carol's. They're not uh, quite... Uh, uh, her as beloved as her birth children, but it's certainly been a, a labor of love over the past decade to send this this these wonderful children now off to uh, and I can't imagine a better home for them than the Indiana University of the Lilly School of uh, Philanthropy at uh, Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, which is the premier school of uh, philanthropy around the globe, and we're deeply honored to have. Uh, the Dean of the School of Philanthropy, Dr. Amir Pasek, with us today. We're also delighted to have our friend, uh, Professor Una Osili, with us as well for this, uh, this remarkable uh, panel, remarkable discussion. And we're also very proud to have friends who have been with us all along uh, this journey in which these uh, indices were created, in which they've really come to help shape uh, philanthropic understanding uh, here and around the globe. Let me just note some of our key partners in this effort, the John Templeton Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the International Development Research Center in Canada, uh, David Schwartz is going to be on the panel from the IDRC, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, uh, the folks at USAID, Bristol Myers Group Foundation, Merck, uh, Pharma, and others who have been friends of ours, friends of uh, this important uh, Effort. We have. Uh, we will have an extraordinary uh, panel discussion, a video, up, uh, shortly. I think that all of you are going to enjoy, which really highlights the important work that uh, the indices uh, have accomplished. And of course, we'll be hearing from uh, Senator Young from Indiana. And let me note on, on that note, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Todd Young with us. He is obviously a leader on these issues. Uh, uh, in Congress on foreign assistance and on uh, foreign aid more broadly. Uh, I should also note, as a matter of pride, Hudson was headquartered for two decades in Indianapolis from 1984 to 2004. I see our good friend Jay Heim back there who was with us, uh, did important work on uh, domestic policy and international affairs and also on faith-based giving there. We did a lot of pioneering work in our years uh, in Indianapolis, whether it be developing the concept of charter schools, developing the welfare reform program that uh, then-Governor Tommy Thompson put in place in Wisconsin that uh, Jay and his team were a part of that later came to shape uh, welfare reform in this country. And so it, it makes the transfer of the indices uh, back to Indiana, all the more fitting, just another tie that we have uh, between Hudson Institute and uh, the state of Indiana. And on, on that note, uh, it's my honor to uh, welcome uh, Dean Pasek to the microphone. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ken, very much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with everybody, and uh, I hope we do justice in welcoming uh, one of your great achievements back back home to Indiana where it can continue uh, to grow. And I also hope that this, this day will be seen as a milestone in the development of philanthropic knowledge when we look back at it. Um, philanthropy, a voluntary action for the public good, the impulse to aid others, has been part of cultures around the world for time immemorial. In some places it is visible and formally structured. In others it is personal and subtle. 
Philanthropy is increasingly global. Trends, practices, and research in philanthropy increasingly transcend national boundaries. As awareness of philanthropy within and across borders has grown, the index of global philanthropy and remittances, as well as the index of philanthropic freedom, have become seminal resources on international philanthropy and international development, and they have done so in a relatively short period. The innovation of the Hudson Institute and of Dr. Carol Edelman and her colleagues at the Center for Global Prosperity in conceiving and implementing the indices mark marks a significant advance in the understanding of global philanthropy and development. They have transformed our perspective on the landscape of international aid. Together, the indices raise the visibility of the fundamental roles philanthropy plays in societies and cultures across the globe. By measuring global philanthropy, the indices make it more transparent, and they uncover new insights into its intricate tapestry, offering a key resource for decision makers in a variety of circumstances. We do not yet have an equivalent for, global, for the global GDP of giving, but the index of philanthropy and global remittances is an important step in that direction. It gives policymakers a sense of the flows of private resources so they can gauge the relative size of these flows compared to government spending and other resource flows. This type of information can also lead to useful public-private partnerships. The index of philanthropic freedom contributes to understanding the ease of access to philanthropic activity within countries and across borders, and can inform what kinds of bilateral or multilateral engagements are more likely to take hold. These indices and their valuable contributions would not be possible without the hard work and insights of many, many partners around the world, or without the confidence and financial support of the many generous funders and donors who have supported these projects over the years. Please join me in thanking all the partners and supporters here with us in the room today. I'd also like to echo Ken's comments and thank our generous funders who have committed to continuing to support the indices as they move to our school, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Charles Stewart Maud Foundation, and the International Development Research Center of Canada. My colleagues at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and I appreciate and applaud the seminal work of Hudson Institute, Carol, and her team, the work they have done in establishing the indices, and we are very pleased and honored to be entrusted with their future. In many ways, it is appropriate that the indices will find their new home in our state. Indiana has a proud legacy of international policy leadership in bipartisan context, from former Congressman Lee Hamilton and former Senator Richard, Richard Luger to Jim Morris, who led the United Nations World Food Program and now chairs the Indiana University Board of Trustees. Our mission as a school is to increase the understanding of philanthropy and to improve its practice worldwide through critical inquiry interdisciplinary research, teaching, and civic engagement. Our work examines philanthropy through a spectrum of different lenses, grounded in the liberal arts and encompassing fields ranging from law to medicine. The school's philanthropic studies faculty includes scholars and researchers in more than 20 disciplines. Indiana University, as a whole, embraces this multidisciplinary, multi-school approach to understanding issues, and we anticipate involvement with the indices from the schools and faculties across the university and far beyond. They will be interested in issues such as global philanthropy, economic development, remittances, global health, public affairs, and others. Their expertise and participation will help enhance and grow the indices going forward. The Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and Indiana University both have a strong tradition of international collaboration. Our school has collaborated with volunteers, professionals, and scholars around the world since our founding as a center in 1987. It has offered training to and learned from our colleagues in more than 40 countries. In 2014, the school created the Stead Family Chair in International Philanthropy with a gift from Jerry and Mary Joy Stead through their family foundation. The chair will advance global understanding of philanthropy across borders and within cultures, conduct original research, translate new knowledge into improvements in the practice of international philanthropy, and, and educate new philanthropic leaders for the international arena. Indiana University itself has more than 60 institute centers and other units with an international focus and offers instruction in more than 55 languages. Nearly 2,000 expert faculty have international roots and about 9,000 international students are enrolled across its campuses. Since 1985, Indiana University has awarded approximately 52,000 degrees and certificates to international alumni and the IU Alumni Association has chapters in 42 countries. And the president of our university, who is a great champion of our school and regrets that he was unable to join us today, himself hails from Australia. 
The size and extent of IU's interconnected international network will provide us with invaluable partners for conducting research for both of the indices while strengthening the philanthropic infrastructure around the world. And international ties are not the only strength we bring to this project. Even before coming to the uh, Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, I was aware of its pioneering research, the breadth and depth of its research expertise, and its objectivity and methodological rigor. We are fortunate to have Dr. Una Osili directing our research, and you will soon see why the indices will be in such good hands. Among our research projects, we have Giving USA, the annual yearbook of U.S. philanthropy, which we conduct on behalf of Giving USA Foundation, and we partner with Coots on the International Million Dollar Donors Report, both of which uh, uh, reports will be strengthened by and, and will contribute to the global indices. In addition, the philanthropy panel study is the largest and most accurate longitudinal study measuring and exploring the U.S. general population's char charitable giving. Conducted every two years in partnership with the University of Michigan's panel study of income dynamics, our signature panel study tracks the same 9,000-plus families and their giving and volunteering over time, adding adult children's uh, households to the sample as they age. The study examines the effects of changes in dynamic personal and socioeconomic factors that inform philanthropic behavior, enabling significant insights. Later this year, with generous funding from the John Templeton Foundation, we will take this work to a new level, providing greater understanding and new resources for scholars, professionals, policy makers, and the public of how generosity changes over the course of a lifetime. Efforts like this also lead us to imagine the global extensions of this kind of work. In short, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy is deeply committed to increasing fundamental knowledge of philanthropy. We believe there are unimagined needs to newly understood ends that await us as a result of basic research into the fundamental questions of why and how people give. And we believe that basic research, research sets an indispensable foundation for the progress of knowledge and for informed policy. That is one of the many reasons we are all so pleased that we will be leading the research for the Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances as well as the Index of Philanthropic Freedom. This is an outstanding opportunity for all of us to discover new knowledge about philanthropy's roots and impacts and the various forms that it does take within and across nations and culture. In doing this, going forward, we will be fortunate to have the ongoing good counsel of Dr. Carol Edelman, who will be joining our faculty as a visiting research professor. We are so pleased now to have you on our team, Carol. As we look to the future of the indices, we plan to build on and expand international collaboration to increase understanding of global philanthropy. And it is our hope that we may further enhance the importance of these indices as a resource for NGOs, for philanthropists, uh, for the public at large, and for policymakers in the U.S. and globally. Try for a moment to remember the world before every country measured GDP. It would be hard to envision our economy and our political life without it. What we end up measuring counts. I anticipate that the reality of philanthropy, its visibility, and its connection to the breadth of activities that matter in society will become more visible, more valued, and more subject to informed discussion as a result of institutionalizing these valuable indices permanently as a part of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Ken and Carol, thank you for entrusting us with this landmark project. And before we move to the next phase of the program, please join me in congratulating Hudson Institute, Ken and Carol, and all that they have accomplished and on this celebration of global philanthropy. We tend to think of foreign aid as basically something government does. Going all the way back in American history, foreign aid has been something we the people have done. And indeed, as the uh, index of global philanthropy and remittances show so well, we the people do a lot more of it than we in our capacity as the government of the United States do. There's a blossoming of um, philanthropy following the creation of greater wealth uh, around the world, plus a deeper exploration about alternative ways of conducting policy or serving people in need uh, beyond uh, the, the government. It began with, in part, an instinctive reaction that was completely correct to, to false charges being made about the U.S. for being stingy in its uh, philanthropic uh, giving. And Carol, she knew it was wrong because she understood that we have a very deep, rich, voluntary sector and that uh, most 
of U.S. philanthropic giving isn't mandated by government, it's by individuals, foundations, and corporations. I had cringed when people started calling America stingy. And when I looked into it, I discovered that it was because the measure that they were using is the government aid as a percentage of a country's gross national income. And because America's economy is so large, when you use that measure, that puts us at the bottom or very close to the bottom. I thought about my own experiences overseas and all of the private voluntary organizations. And so I said, well, how much are they giving if, since the measure being used was just a government aid measure? And no one knew. We realized that there was something going on that we had missed um, uh, uh, in government-run aid programs, and that was private foreign aid. But we didn't know the magnitude of it. We didn't know who was involved in it. Uh, we had no numbers. Our engagement with the developing world is through four main flows. And of course, one is government aid, and one is global philanthropy. The other is remittances, the monies that migrants send back to their hometowns, and private capital investment from companies. So we came up with the concept of total economic engagement. We also really felt it made sense to just tell people that compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. It wasn't until uh, 2004, uh, Jan Egeland at the UN called the United States stingy, looking at our, our government aid as a percent of our gross national income. Carol really hit back against uh, these charges and there was sig all of a sudden significant interest in the notion of what private development assistance looks like. Our data was out there then. The reporters would find out that, wait a minute, there was an argument against calling it the U.S. stingy. We really took off at that point and I was able then to develop funding sources to put together a, a full-scale index of global philanthropy. In 2006, we published our first index of global philanthropy. In order to enable giving to have the greatest impact, it's critically important to have the right data. Without understanding what the landscape is, people can't make the right decisions. And so we were delighted to partner uh, with the Hudson Institute to sponsor uh, the indices. It's critically important to understand uh, what is happening and what the potential is globally in terms of giving. We are just releasing the new 2016 Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances, and we're excited that the results continue to show the growth in private giving. For the United States, only 9% of our total economic engagement with the developing world is through our government aid. It really created a revolution in how uh, overseas development assistance is understood. It got the attention of policymakers around the globe. All of a sudden, it sparked the rise of uh, discussions about the extent of uh, private giving, the major multilateral global organizations, whether it be the OECD in Paris, whether it be the IMF or the World Bank, started to recognize the importance and the impact that this private giving was having. The m numbers it provides have changed our understanding of international giving. Now virtually every one of these development agencies that or the Western democracies now have their own public-private partnership programs and I think a great degree that's as a result of Carol's, Carol Edelman's research in this index which is read all over the world now. We realized that we were missing a really important other side of the coin in global philanthropy. And that was what we called philanthropic freedom or the enabling environment for people to do philanthropy. With the uh, Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances, the effort is on understanding the actual numbers, the size of the philanthropic flows. With the Index of Philanthropic Freedom, that looks at the institutional environment around philanthropy, the legal frameworks, the constraints, the incentives, as well as the barriers to philanthropy. So I think having both projects is, in, is increasingly important as philanthropy plays a vital role in many nations. The index isn't just saying you have a score of this or that. A good part of the index is pointing out, using in-country and out-of-country experts to say, here's where the regulation can be 
shifted or changed in a way that's going to help civil society. There's so many problems around the world when we look at the issue of closing space for civil society. We're seeing the erection of aid barriers, philanthropic protectionism, that's actually restricting the ability of philanthropy to engage internationally, undermining, I would argue, not only U.S. philanthropy, but also undermining outcomes for beneficiaries around the world. So there's definitely a problem out there. The question is, how do you fix it? And that's where the index comes in, because it identifies the concrete issues that are constraining philanthropy. When I heard from Carol Edelman that she was uh, considering uh, changing her role vis-a-vis -vis the indices, it occurred to me a good home for them would be here participating uh, in this it would not only give a steady base to what is currently going on, but also gives a lot of potential for improvement. I wanted to find a home for the indices where I knew the data would be top-notch and uh, where there would be no question of continuing it and enriching it. It's, it's an honor for us to be taking it over from, from, from Hudson and uh, we, as the first school of philanthropy in the world, have relationships all around the world. So we think they're going to strengthen those relationships and allow us to help nurture a whole network of scholars and analysts who are working in this area and bring more visibility uh, and rigor and systematic attention to uh, philanthropy and voluntary action more broadly among policymakers around the world. It's a, a sign of the continued strong links of Hudson to the state of Indiana. Although we left Indianapolis, we moved our headquarters here. It's all together fitting in a way now that the index has grown up, the indices have grown up and they're, they're now kind of adults and they can now go off on their own and, and go back uh, to Indiana. Having that imprimatur on the indices will get the message out even further and will help incorporate that kind of thinking into the way the next generation of philanthropists approach the, the major problems that, that uh, we face around the globe. I think it's, it's an extraordinary platform where, and we're delighted and honored that the Lilly School is going to be taking over these projects. You've got me teed up. And Adam, thank you for getting that going. That was a good job under pressure. <laughs> Made it happen. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, thanks to all, all of you in the room, the partners and supporters. I, I look around with so many people that were part of these indices, Dilip and uh, so many folks um, uh, that have helped and believed in this and and, and made it happen, so thank you. We've got a lot of brain power in this audience, so you may be getting some of the uh, the questions turning your way. <laughs> and um, all the supporters, too, that are here, thank you so much. And um, Ken mentioned uh, our main supporters, uh, and we've got two of them here, the John Templeton Foundation and the International Development Research Center, so thank you for coming. Um, our Gates folks were all in, in, in India for a meeting, and. Uh, uh, our Mott people were uh, at a board meeting too, so they couldn't make it. And of course, the dean of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, uh, Una, and the wonderful staff that we've been working with over the past months uh, have been terrific. And um, so, thanks to everybody. So we saw the graphs and numbers in the um, in the video. And just before presenting, um, you know, just I, I want to get to 
really what this is, this meeting is one, the launch of our latest numbers and a, just a quick discussion of those. And then we're going to turn it over to our panelists. Um, but I wanted to just mention two things that, that didn't really come across in the video because we were told videos have to be kept to less than 10 minutes or the, the audience will rebel. And we, we, we agreed with that. I, and you stayed. So this was good. Um, we saw the graphs and the numbers, but what the first thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, before I do present these latest numbers, that um, the video really didn't describe the hundreds of partnerships, not just in this room, but hundreds of international partnerships with um, individuals, institutions, uh, and who worked with us and who were measuring philanthropy for the first time. And sometimes it was one person working very hard, not having studies and designing the study. And, and we worked really hard with them and how to teach them how to get the different flows. And so the fact that the index is going into a teaching institution is making me very happy because they're eager to learn. I just had two Chinese women come in and they had read the both indices cover to cover and they want to replicate it and we're get diving into methodological questions and so th this is exactly what we want and and why you all will be able to you know make this really happen because the the demand is out there and so the second thing is that while you saw the pictures of the amazing pro amazing projects and people in that when you came in and some of them in the videos um, you know, it really couldn't capture the um, it, just the dedication of the people in these projects. And so it, our indexes, indices weren't really just about the numbers. They were about the amazing people doing things um, overseas and how impressive it is. Um, and just, you know, from random acts of kindness to really sophisticated social investing and the diversity and range of global philanthropy is absolutely incredible. And we did, we did want it to not just be about the numbers. But the numbers really help us tell that story and help people understand that story. And so for that, I'm going to, um, here's my little thing here, um, just turn to the latest results and then we'll be, OK. You saw a lot of graphs on there. And we didn't really stay on them long enough to know what they were. But um, the top green line is the all private flows. And bear with me, because this graph is very simple, but it really says a lot. And it's going to help you understand it all. And then, then we'll move ahead. The green line is all private flows. And the from the left, from 1992, it goes uh, horizontally over to 2014, the latest year for which we had comparable data. And this is the private flows, which include private capital investment, remittances, and philanthropy, going from the donor countries, including 11 emerging economies, which we included. And we're going to be doing getting more of those and when Indiana does this again in three years, uh, more emerging economies. And so it's all the private flows going from these donor nations to the developing world, as defined by the OECD, to those countries. Um, and, and so that, in that way, it's very com it is comparable to our official development assistance, comparable to our, our government aid. And that's why we, why we did it, because we wanted to get a sense of, of, of what that comparison was. So the green line is all private, and the gray line is government. And while government aid has, you know, it has steadily increased, and each year it does increase, um, it's still, because the private giving is increasing in such a great amount, um, the government has become less and less of a, a portion of that. And so in, in 2014, if you look at the, the single line of all private flows, 85% of all donor countries' economic engagement with the developing world uh, was through private financial flows, and only 15% was government, which was, in, a, in essence, basically uh, the the entire ratio was reversed from 30 to four in the 50s and 60s and and early 70s it was the opposite and that when the Marshall Plan came in there was very it was mainly government and government aid prevailed after that and it was very little private investment very little private um, uh, foundations and private giving and uh, um, and not as many remittances either because of migration being less um, and so. This is the, um, you know, where 
that 1992 was the inflection point. And I remember um, President um, of the World Bank Wolfenson making a speech sometime in 92 or 93. And I remember him saying to the employees, um, you know, we have to find, with this happening now, with the private flows increasing, we have to find a way to be, to become relevant and, and stay relevant to the developing world. And Dennis Whittle later on will be talking to us about, you know, the amazing experiments and, and pilot projects he did at the World Bank, which led to globalgiving.com. And, and, uh, um, We've definitely, you know, seen the world just speed up on global philanthropy and, uh, and do a wonderful uh, job with it. And so what this is, now many people think, oh my goodness, you know, well, this is bad. This is a bad thing. But what does this line reflect? Well, it reflects the progress in developing countries. Um, because of a lot of our government aid, because of a lot of our previous philanthropy, because of many things, the developing world was changing. There, it is increasingly more of a skilled labor force. Oh, that's fun. I don't know. Oh, is that coming? Maybe. Hopefully it's not from my iPhone. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, a skilled labor force, um, which can support private enterprises, investment, and uh, there's more high net worth individuals. There's a rising middle middle class, and, and the middle class is now starting community foundations, which are the fastest uh, growing type of foundation in the world, these community fa foundations throughout the developing world. And in other indicators, the percent of people living in extreme poverty uh, went from 36% in 1990 down to roughly 10% in 2015. China alone went from 60% in 1990 to 6.3% in 20, in 2011. Now that isn't to say that there, you know, we still have extreme poverty, but the rates have been in, uh, going down very dramatically. And that's what's reflected in these numbers because we've got people in private, in private institutions and we're seeing the growth of uh, philanthropic infrastructure slowly but gradually in developing countries. The, um, Demographic changes, uh, with having a pop, the populations now used to be much more with younger people, with infants and children. Now that population bulge is coming into the, uh, working, working ages. So there's more productivity going on in the developing world. Uh, in fact, the aging problem is becoming a problem. One of the, one of the reports at the UN was, you know, unfortunately the developing world became old before it became rich. <laughs> this is through tremendous gains in healthcare and medicines and, and vaccines and, uh, um, uh, and, um, really, you know, making that entire demographic fact change. While, um, human rights and democracy are certainly threatened now, we have Daniel, Daniel, where are you? Daniel Kalengart from the Freedom House, yeah, here, who, um, and I'm on the Freedom House board, and Freedom House does an amazing job at, at, um, measuring, uh, the freedom in the world. And while it's true, I'm sure, Daniel, that there's still more, over 25 years, there's more countries ranked as free, we're seeing a falling off of that every year. And um, uh, that, Doug Rutzen is going to talk to us about that and why that's happening. And um, uh, so if you've got any questions afterwards at the reception, Daniel, Daniel is your man. And we, in fact, did our ranking system for our Index of Philanthropic Freedom based on the same five scale that Freedom House did because we wanted to. And we had people from Freedom House helping us <laughs> to design that, along with Doug Rutzen from the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. Um, Technology, of course, we all know, the internet, the cell phone. One World Bank seminar I went to called, called the cell phone the industrial revolution of the developing world. Um, uh, and we just had people were empowered by the internet to find information for long distance training, uh, crowdsourcing. Dennis and I were talking before that the word global giving, which he co-founded with his wife, Mari, um, started before there was even a word for crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing sort of developed because of you five years later, and I, I know you're going to tell that tell that story. Uh, so the next slide is simply the breakdown of these numbers. The top one is um, uh, private capital investment, which has always been the highest. 
Uh, the second one is remittances, which is a really just a huge, huge flow that was kind of the forgotten flow. People really didn't talk about it until about 10 years ago. And I'll just say a word about remittances. Um, the, um, that they have been found to be, you know, directly correlated to a decrease in poverty for poverty reduction. They are greater than official development assistance in philanthropy combined. They, when a country increases its remittances, it can increase its credit ratings. Projects have been developed where a steady stream of remittances coming into um, a, a person's bank account can be used as collateral for loans. De La Brata at the World Bank has de is developing diaspora bonds for developing countries, just like the Israeli bonds. So they're an exciting, uh, um, you know, exciting financial flow that really hasn't been recognized and the potential for partnering that a AID has a wonderful program uh, on the diaspora network and uh, the World Bank is working in this area now too. So um, then the th third line is the uh, U.S. Uh, or is the overall um, official development assistance. And the last yellow line is the global pr private philanthropy. Now, in this case, philanthropy is still below government aid. In the case of the United States, though, our our philanthropy is actually higher than official development assistance. But it's partially a measurement problem because while we've created wonderful partnerships and Japan is replicating um, our, the methodology, Netherlands has replicated it in, largely, and our emerging economies are working to replicate it, we still, we know we're not capturing the full amount. And I'm sure that that line will go up a lot. But it, it probably will stay maybe about the same as official development aid. We don't know. So now I'm going to just turn um, quickly to the, uh, uh, this is the US. And these are the, you know, open the envelope. and. You know, maybe it will, will be La La Land, or maybe it won't. <laughs> anyway, we're going to open the envelope. These are the new numbers. Um, and the U.S., this, these again are for 2014. Um, and the new, the, the, so they've, you know, we do have, on some of these categories, we have more recent numbers, but they're not that much different. Um, these are the comparable numbers that we have. So uh, the government aid is uh, $33 billion. And the um, private giving is, uh, you know, almost really 44 billion. And under that, you can see foundations are 4.7 billion of that. Corporations, 11.3 billion. They've moved very, very high. And that is through um, just all the company corporate social responsibility programs, uh, pharmaceutical donations, and, and the work that they're doing in public private partnerships. Uh, private and voluntary organizations is the highest highest it's ever been. And this is largely a proxy for individual giving um, because this is the money that individuals are giving to care, uh, World Vision, Catholic Relief Services. So it's a good measure of, of individual giving. And it should be known that that number, the, the 15 billion, is actually after the U.S. official development assistance, which is the highest number of any financial flow going to the developing world, our individuals and, and uh, NGOs are sending the second highest number amount of um, giving to the developing world, which, which was kind of interesting to me. Um, and it, just to give you an idea, like our, our religious giving number is $6 billion. And that religious, just just to give you a scale, that's actually greater than the Netherlands official development assistance. And our foundation number, foundations give more than Australia and uh, Australia's ODA. And um, for corporate corporations, give more than Japan gives in in ODA. So these are these are big big numbers, and um, they they tell a big big story. The um, landscape of private giving. Um, is well these are just remittances and you'll you'll find this in the copy of the index so you can go online and get to this index via uh, www.hudson.org slash CGP oh, but anyway it's in it's in the um, uh, in the pro in the uh, report so you'll see it and uh, just very quickly it's what what we've seen the changes in private giving and I want to hear from all of our panelists too on this that I, I feel like what we've seen in all of our research is a demand-driven development and the democratization of voice, which is Dennis's term, that this is versus um, top-down planning um, 
it, there's much more local involvement with, in private giving. And as Dennis has put it so nicely, that there's a lot of ordinary Oprahs out there, you know, giving through Kiva and uh, global giving um, and able to have a say in, in what's happening. Um, and there's loyalty. Well, that's the democratization. There's loyalty to fixing the problem um, and not necessarily loyalty to one charity. Because, and, and the young and it's younger donors, hands on, and they want to um, really be involved uh, and sort of do whatever it takes: public funds, private funds. Um, you know, let's just solve this problem. You know, let's just not just do this project and then to to have another check written for it. Remittances uh, we've talked about. And for corporations, I, you, Susan Raymond has called this the new chessboard for corporation. Corporations, it's not just writing a check anymore. For a while, they felt they were doing shared value because they would be, you know, involving their, um, they would be using supply chains of farmers in countries where they were working. Um, and it's still some of that, but it's, it's again, you know, focused on fixing the problem and sustainable supply chains. And, you know, it isn't anymore just the head of a corporate foundation that can do the philanthropy. It's basically involving all kinds of skills in corporations that they, you know, when you're fixing a problem of healthcare or education and involved in a big problem, you have to learn and do a lot more uh, and have a lot of, you know, broad and diverse range of skills. Um, so that is, um, oh, was I on the wrong slide when I was doing all that? No, I guess I wasn't. There we go. Anyway, so just two slides on why measure philanthropic freedom, philanthropy, and because we were transferring this index, but this was one that we did in 2015. But just to quickly give you an idea, um, philanthropy and remittances are an increasingly important part of the financial flows. And that we saw in the in the graphs showing us where the private uh, giving or private money was going, and ease of giving had not been systematically measured across a large sample size on specific philanthropic indicators, and organizing information on barriers and incentives makes it easier to recognize, study, and implement policy changes. And Doug's going to get into all of that. We have a, a a world map of philanthropic freedom that's in this report. And if you go online, um, you can click onto countries and see the country report that our country experts wrote. So if you're going into a country, either to invest or to study, this, these are good reports to look at. And these were some of the trends and themes, um, and I'm going to really go, I'm going to let Doug talk about these things that are happening now that are we found through our country experts on the Russia's foreign agent law that, uh, for keeping um, uh, NGOs from accepting uh, outside money, especially from the United States, restrictions on the ability to inc incorporate and operate illicit financial flow legislation, which is taking care of a, of a legitimate problem, but it's having, you know, effects on NGOs reporting requirements that they really have trouble meeting. And finally, um, the foreign exchange regulations and capital controls, which also affect giving. So um, I, without any further ado, I would like to start with, we're going to start with um, uh, Una and um, Una, w would you like to just um, let it go? Right. <laughs> Una's going to tell you how, um, I talk about a lot of things, but uh, particularly how they are going to really in, enhance and improve uh, the indices and some of the other fabulous programs that they're doing at Indiana. Wonderful. I hope the microphone is on. I think it is. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you. A special uh, note of thanks to Hudson and to Carolyn Ken for hosting us, and also to our dean, Dean Pasek, who was just um, a fearless leader in this transfer <laughs> process of the indices from Hudson to Indiana. So as Carol said, every uh, project actually has a story. And as I reflect on why we're here and some of the discussions we've already had, I'm kind of reminded of myself as a graduate student many years ago. I'm going to date myself by saying when. 
And at the time uh, in grad school, remittances were not yet measured. So the World Bank wasn't measuring it. No international institution was measuring it. But I was interested in remittances as a graduate student and uh, went out and actually collected data on remittances, starting with the migrants here in the US, but tracing their home families back in the home country of origin. And it was through that work that I first realized the complexity of global transfers. Migrants were sending money home, and it was assumed that a lot of this was being sent to their families in their origin countries. But it turns out these flows were more complex. They included family transfers, they also included investment-related transfers, where migrants were investing in projects in their villages, in their home communities. But another segment that was also unmeasured and uncaptured at the time were the philanthropic investments that migrants were making. And that was really new to me, certainly. I hadn't expected to find that. But in villages throughout southeastern Nigeria, I saw schools, water projects, um, hospitals, computer centers, all kinds of things that migrants had envisioned and implemented, usually in partnership with their village associations, their hometown associations. But the government was largely uninvolved in these transfers. So that immediately helped me understand that just because we're not measuring something yet doesn't mean it's not taking place. And sometimes scholars are quite late to this process. Uh, in the case of global philanthropy, I feel like we're very much at an inflection point, a moment where philanthropy is changing globally. It's part of every culture. It's always been. But the data to start to understand those patterns and those trends is literally unfolding before our eyes. I'm also really excited to say that for the first time, um, we are operating in a data-rich environment. There are many sources of data. Technology, in particular, has made it possible for us to study not just the existing forms of philanthropy, but some of these newer forms that are starting to emerge. So that's kind of a way of introducing my own interest in this project. And I'm so delighted that uh, Carol and her team will be partnering with us going forward as we seek to build on this excellent work and move it into the future. So one of the things we've been thinking about as we start to build this project in Indiana using our team of graduate students, scholars, as well as a network of partners around the world. Number one, we're expanding it to 81 countries. And when I told Carol 81 countries, she said, that number keeps going up, and it's true. So our goal is eventually that all countries in the world will be included. And we've also really pushed ourselves to make sure that we expand this study in the global south, where it's really important that we have data-rich sources to draw on. Uh, in addition to expanding the countries covered, we're also going to be enhancing regional reviewers and the review system that we use so that there are several layers of review built into the construction of both projects. The other part of the enhancement that I'm particularly excited about building on our school's tradition around the humanities and liberal arts is really capturing the complexity of philanthropy in those settings. Um, our dean recently hosted a, a summit last week at the school where we talked about the danger of a single story or the danger of a single data point. And our goal is really to tell the complex stories that are emerging in different parts of the world, different regions of the world, different continents. And to skate to where the puck is using a Canadian analogy, uh, a hockey analogy. So we're not just looking at what philanthropy looks like today, but what it will look like in the future. And to do that, we're going to be capturing social enterprises, impact investments, and many of the newer forms that are starting to emerge in the developing world, but also throughout the world. And finally, as we seek to understand the ecosystem around philanthropy globally, we're going to be drawing on expertise uh, within the school, but also surrounding the school. And first, I want to mention we're partnering with um, the School of Global and International Studies at IU, but also our colleagues at SPIA, the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. But then we have an international uh, 
basically advisory group that we'll be drawing on. And that group will be twofold, one that will be researchers, but we'll also be drawing in practitioners and those who are leaders in those countries. Um, another, uh, of course I could go on, but I'll just end by saying that dissemination is a big piece of this project. We want to get the word out. So if we do this great work, but it sits and resides in our offices and computers, I think our job will not be done. So we want to do the next step, which is actually to take this work to conversations throughout the world. And we're starting to build on networks so that we can uh, convene communities of scholars and practitioners who will use this information in their daily work. We're also going to be reaching out to policymakers in these 81 countries to share the results and findings and engage in a discussion. So uh, we, once again, a word of thanks and congratulations to Carol and her team, to Hudson, and of course to our dean for supporting this work from its very early stages. And also an invitation to all of you in the audience to partner with us in this next phase of the project. We're going to need all of you as reviewers, as disseminators of this work, but also to involve you in the conversation about how we can measure and capture philanthropy, but also how we can improve its practice globally. Thank you, Una, and thanks for reminding us that what counts is not always counted. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's something that we learned. <laughs> Um, well, let's turn to Doug Rutzen, um, who has have, has been with us before at Hudson, and um, we just we always enjoy having you here because Doug really can tell us not only what's really happening in the field, not just the laws that are on the books, but what is really happening out there, and um, has just a, a, a wonderful wealth of knowledge of real examples of what the incentives and the barriers are and what's happening in the world. So. Doug, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. Yeah. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's a celebration not only of global philanthropy, but also of you, oh, Dr. Carol you. Adam. Thank, Thank you for here. your public service. Oh, yeah. 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 So during this panel, we're going to hear about the continuum of environments. Some will be quite progressive, and philanthropy is, of course, dynamic and growing. But at the same time, we also see that in many countries, Governments are converting the rule of law into the rule by law. They're seeking to shackle philanthropy and civil society to the state. And what I'm going to do is provide a few examples of this phenomenon and unpack it in just a few minutes. First, data points. My organization works in 100 countries, and we've been monitoring trends since 2012. Since then, 65 countries have introduced or enacted 130 initiatives that would restrict philanthropy or civil society. Now, disaggregating this a bit, what we find is that half of the initiatives would restrict the ability of people to form or to operate a nonprofit organization or foundation, half. A third of the restrictions would try to target or constrain access to domestic or international philanthropy. I'll give some examples in a moment. The remainder seek to constrain other forms of civic action, including peaceful protests. Now, we're not talking about mild forms of restriction, some sort of administra light administrative burden or requirement. In fact, what we're generally talking about are pretty severe restrictions. Let's start with the first category, restrictions on the ability to form or operate an organization. In many countries, we find that there are these interventionist governments that think that they have a right to decide whether you and I can set up an organization to help kids, to do research on economic development, or even to set up a think tank like Hudson Institute. Other countries impose incredibly high barriers to enter civic space. Let me give you an example. Eritrea, one of the poorest countries in the world. They allow one form of nonprofit organization and only one form. It's called a humanitarian and relief organization. In order to set up that organization, you need a million dollars capitalization. That's more than the average Eritrean will earn in a thousand lifetimes. Jeez. As a result, it's virtually impossible to set up a domestic humanitarian or relief organization. 
if it's an international humanitarian organization in Eritrea, $2 million. Even if you can overcome this basic barrier to enter civic space, we find that governments are restricting access to philanthropy and other forms of funding. Let's say you wanted to organize exactly this meeting, and you needed a few dollars to do so, but you're located in Egypt, Bangladesh, Jordan, Azerbaijan, or in fact about 30 other countries. In order to organize this meeting and receive international funding to do so, you would need to get the government's permission to do that. Other countries don't have an approval process. They simply try to stigmatize the receipt of international funding. You saw from the video the example of the Russian foreign agents legislation. I think everybody knows about that. But for those who don't, it's a situation where if you're an advocacy group and you receive international funding, you have to list on all your publications that you're a foreign agent, which is the same term Stalin used for foreign spy. Jesus. There are also restrictions on domestic philanthropy. In Saudi Arabia, you need the government's approval in order to organize any fundraising event, even a gala dinner. Some of you have been to Kosovo. You know it's largely a cash-based economy, but the law prohibits cash donations exceeding 500 euros in a day from a single source or 1,000 euros over the course of an entire year. If you were to give, for example, 20 euros a week to your favorite charity in cash, you can go to jail for two years in Kosovo. Restrictions on domestic philanthropy. Now we're asked, why are we finding this uptick in constraints? To answer that question, I've written a paper. It's called A Barriers and the Rise of Philanthropic Protectionism. We've actually mapped out what the governments say their justifications are. I'll just simply identify three. One, counterterrorism and anti-money laundering. This was the justification behind the Kosovar law. Under the law, NGOs are put in the same category as casinos and banks. They're considered to be reporting entities. And the law requires all NGOs, regardless of size or budget, to have an anti-money laundering compliance officer on staff. So even if you're an all-volunteer organization, you have to have a professionally trained compliance officer. Why? Because this really oddly named technical group called the Financial Action Task Force, the most technical body that's the most important one no one's ever heard of, decided that nonprofits were particularly vulnerable to terrorist abuse. They said this about 15 years ago. The problem? They were wrong. They were just simply empirically wrong. It took us about 13 years to convince them to do the research, try to collect the data. They finally did. There are over 10 million nonprofits in the world. When the FATF did research to find the number of cases where nonprofits were even allegedly engaged in terrorism, they found a total of 102 cases out of 10 million organizations. So finally, this summer, the FATF changed its language and eliminated the provision saying that nonprofits are particularly vulnerable to terrorist abuse, but the damage has been done. In country after country, we're seeing restrictions on nonprofits, and in addition, banks refusing to do business with nonprofits because they consider them to be particularly vulnerable to terrorist abuse. So number one, counterterrorism, anti-money laundering. Two, development cooperation. It sounds good, we want effective development. And in 2005, we had something called the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. Had great language, host country ownership. Sounds great, but wait a minute. Ownership? They own your philanthropy? It vested a property right in host governments over aid transfers and philanthropic flows. And governments took that really seriously. So if you wanted to, for example, engage in international philanthropy in a particular country, they would decide which organizations you can give it to, whether they could block your funding. And in many countries, they insisted that the money be given to them because they own your philanthropic flows. That's point two. Final point, the issue of fundamental freedom. Dr. Edelman mentioned Freedom House. She's on the board of Freedom House. Daniel Kallengard is here. It's interesting. Last night I did some research on a correlation between 
Freedom of the World by Freedom House and the findings in the Index of Philanthropic Freedom. I think it's quite interesting. If you look at the top quartile of countries in the Index of Philanthropic Freedom, so the places where it's easiest to give philanthropy, every single country is rated free by Freedom House. If you look at the bottom quartile, not a single country is rated free by Freedom House. In fact, 70% of the countries in the bottom quartile of the Index of Philanthropic Freedom are given Freedom House's lowest rating, not free. The remainder, partly free. Now, I think some of us will say this is intuitive. Of course, that's the case. But what I think is really interesting is that it's data. And I think all of us prefer data to intuition. And I think this is the reason why the index is so valuable. It's an attempt to actually provide numbers and data underlying some of our intuitions. The second reason I think it's really important is because we have local experts that are actually doing the reports, identifying problems. And as we all know, if people are involved in identifying problems, they have ownership in finding solutions. So it's leading to reform initiatives in a number of countries. And finally, the index identifies good practices that we can scale up. And I'll end on that positive note. I talked about the continuum. I've been asked to focus on the restrictive initiatives. But in fact, there's a lot of good news as well. France and Slovakia have recently passed laws permitting tax donations. 13 out of 16 states in Germany have just reduced administrative burdens for public fundraising. And Tunisia actually has gotten rid of a registration process for nonprofits. All you simply have to do is send a letter to the government saying, I set up my nonprofit. And it's then established. And it's helping with the rebuilding of democratic institutions in that country. So progress is possible. You'll hear more about these positive developments from my colleagues, but that's the point. There is this continuum, one that progresses from the restrictive environments, which are these open environments. Philanthropy is dynamic. It is growing. And I thank the Hudson Institute. I thank Dr. Edelman and Indiana University for taking this initiative, moving it forward with such vigor and which with such analysis. Thank you very much. Oh, Doug, thank you. Well, we thank you, Doug, for your enthusiasm. I mean, you would inspire all those students, right? <laughs> to stay in philanthropy. Um, and I should say that the Tunisian country expert, that uh, you're, you're talking about Tunisia changing, we got an email from him, because he ranked Tunisia, and we got an email saying that because of that work, he had been asked by the government to write the first, um, the entire nonprofit um, laws for Tunisia. So we were very excited about that. In fact, you are, and you had a program from, was it AID or, or someone that could allow you to help them? Correct. Right? And so uh, I was able to turn him over to Doug, and so he could work with him on helping him develop that. So pub good public-private partnerships at work here, yeah. Thank you, Doug. That was great. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know where well, I know the senator is being a little later, but let's just start um, with um, Dennis. We're going to yeah, we're going to turn to you, Dennis Whittle, the co-founder of uh, Global Giving, Global Giving with his wife, and and the recent founder of a wonderful organization called Feedback Labs. Um, and I will just let you tell your story because you I, you were a great role model to me because we both came from World Bank. I was with AID, and I met Dennis, and I thought, ah, I have, I've met a thought partner here because <laughs> we agreed on a lot. Thanks, Carol, and uh, thanks also, again, just echoing people's thanks to Hudson for being a platform uh, for this over the years, and it's been uh, – great to be peripherally involved and to be here several times. So Ken, I think Ken, had to leave. Uh, Ken W. had to leave, Ken ASE is still here. So uh, <laughs> thanks to Hudson. And uh, I didn't realize until I came here that it's also a, kind of a homecoming to Indiana for me too. Because when I went to grad school uh, in New Jersey in 1983, I was in economics, studying economics classes, and I wanted to see my advisor to ask him for advice. I was, you know, technical economics, I was a little overwhelmed. And my advisor was a guy named John Lewis, who had come from Indiana University. Mm. And I still remember this conversation with Professor Lewis, and he said, Dennis, you know, you've got to be good technically, 
But then he leans forward and he says, but let me just tell you a little secret. A little common sense will go a long way. <laughs> and so I went back to class and uh, graduated. And uh, in some ways, my career has been uh, influenced by the DNA of Indiana University. So I'm happy to see it come, come full circle. <laughs> I was thinking other, about other uh, influences in my life, and I also had the great, I've had many pieces of luck like that, and one of them was, uh, I see Kimon and Amy are here, but for some reason, I don't even know, I got a chance to meet Sir John Templeton back probably in 2004 or something like that, 2003, uh, right after we started Global Giving, and we were struggling, I felt kind of like I was a grad student again, and Sir John, who was 100 or something years old at that point, he he leans to me and he says to me, and I still can see him, he said, uh, you have to have the courage to, to see the world differently. And he said, if people aren't resisting or criticizing what you're doing, then you're being too conventional. And uh, he was kind of like an oracle, and I sort of couldn't, didn't know what to say, but I nodded, and I, but it made a very big impression on me. And I remember... Um, when Carol started uh, this index, that she came under a fair amount of heat because she was trying to plow a, a new whatever. And uh, that echoed in my mind that uh, she, was, uh, she was being criticized and people were resisting it because she was, had the courage to see the world differently. So right before this, I met someone who has known Carol since 1968, and I will resist the temptation to reveal the stories I heard about her hijinks. Uh, I'm not going to even reveal who it was. Um, uh, but I will say... having family and friends here, you know, <laughs> telling old stories. No, I will say that Carol is... I was trying to think she, she's, the, <clears throat> she's the M... She's the woman of M's, I decided. Uh, and... She pioneered uh, methodology and measurement of philanthropic giving and remittances. Uh, and she uh, pioneered uh, measuring the magnitudes of remittances and philanthropic giving. Um, and, but she did something more profound as she was doing that and the index that you and your team here have done, that you kind of paved the way for markets, markets in, in aid, um, and I don't remember if you, if you, <laughs> I'm, I don't remember if you, uh, I don't know if you remember what someone said at an early uh, Hudson conference, but uh, people were arguing about the size of the remittances and A's and all this stuff. And somebody got up and said, you know, it ain't the meat, it's the motion. And two more M's. And uh, uh, we, uh, that was kind of funny, but it was actually very profound. Because it's not so much the amount of capital or funds that flows, although that's very important, but it's the way in which funds flow to their best and highest uses. And markets um, mobilize funds, and then they allow for uh, what we call an evolution, a mutation and selection, depending on fitness. Or in markets, they uh, uh, well-functioning markets allow access, uh, uh, and they allow for innovation, and they also allow for exit of organizations and products that don't have impact. So Carol is the woman of methodology, measurement, magnitude, and markets. Uh, and that's kind of been a little bit uh, uh, the arc of my own career a little bit. Um, as Carol said, I spent the first 14 or 15 years of my life at the World Bank doing giant aid projects. Uh, and it was kind of more the government or the official development angle. Some of them worked, some didn't work, um, and I'm proud of some, and I'm not proud of others, uh, uh, but that was kind of the government angle. And I noticed along the way that um, the only people who had access to develop designing projects were kind of people like us, who were already part of the in crowd. And so projects at the USAID or World Bank would be developed by a bunch of people like us, and we'd sit around and say, do you know, what do you think, what do you think? And we'd make up uh, projects based on what we thought the problems of a country were and what the solutions were. And in the late 90s, uh, through a series of coincidences, I, uh, my co-founder uh, of Global Giving and I ended up putting on an open access marketplace for innovation at the World Bank, where we just allowed anybody in the world 
to come and pitch their ideas. And we put up a few million dollars, which is nothing at the World Bank. And uh, we said, anybody can come. You don't even have to register. The, you know, the whole sophistication of the registration thing. People wanted us to create a, like an NGO registration. We said, no, 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 it's too complicated. And it just send us almost, it was like, almost like send us a letter and then you can come. And that unintentionally um, ended up being very successful. And we saw the power of what happens when you just give people access. And we had hundreds of groups from around the world competing just to have their voice heard. Uh, and we put up $5 million of startup capital. Um, and then at the end of that event, uh, I, I still remember this as well, a woman from South Africa came up to uh, Mari and me and said, uh, well, we didn't win. And I, I, I said, well, I'm sorry, it's a competition. Not everybody can, can win. Uh, and come back in a couple of years and maybe we'll do this again. And she said, I, she says, she said, now listen to me, sonny boy. Uh, she was like towering over me like this. Listen to me, sonny boy. And uh, she said, we don't want to wait two more years to try our, to pitch our idea again. And we don't think the World Bank is the only game in town. And so when are you going to start a secondary market where other people can hear our ideas? And I still remember this clearly as well. It, it's, I, I, I thought that was the dumbest thing I had ever heard. Didn't she know that you know aid required people like us to come up with sophisticated analyses and ideas, uh, uh, not people like her from some small nonprofit in South Africa? But I couldn't. This, these words echoed in my in my head, and Mari and I couldn't. Uh, we we couldn't think of a reason to say no to this woman from South Africa. So we did the unthinkable, and we resigned from the World Bank at the end of the year 2000. And we just decided to launch this website where anybody in the world could post a project, and anybody in the world could fund it. And uh, uh, we, uh, this was five years before crowdfunding even appeared in print. Um, it was, uh, I'm still terrified when I think of us doing that. It was very rough. It was duff, difficult going from a, like a director at the World Bank to an entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, but over time, thanks in part to people like Sir John Templeton, and people, you know, even talking to people like Kimon. I didn't know Amy back then, but Kimon and his colleagues, um, they gave us the ideas and oxygen to keep going. And now Global Giving is operates in 165 countries, fighting against those things that we were just hearing about. Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have gone through it, and um, thousands of projects. But a couple of years ago. Uh, I, uh, Mari and I started thinking about, so, okay, we've got the access part of the marketplace, because really anybody can apply. Um, but there's another part of markets, and that's voice, and the sort of the consumer or user end of the spectrum. And what can we do to give people on the ground around the world a voice, of whether, even whether these nonprofit projects are working? And so a bunch of organizations, this is, as with anything I've been involved in, I'm only the co-founder, a bunch of organizations got together and decided to create feedback labs uh, to focus on giving the people on the ground voice about whether they like the way that money that Carol has, talk, has been measuring is being spent. Uh, and it's early days of uh, whether we'll succeed in that or not, but um, hopefully that is where the puck is going, and hopefully we'll uh, get back together and talk about that uh, down the line. But uh, let me just say thanks again to Hudson and, and to Carol for having the courage to see the world differently and to Indiana University for bringing it all back home. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, what a great story. What a great story. Thanks. Um, so we do want to hear more. So we're going to open this up to questions after David and um, uh, Schwartz, and we, I do want to hear more about Feedback Labs, because you've got, what, 200 organizations now that are part of this? And you and I have, how many lunches have we had at, uh, and how can we evaluate aid right. without having to do double-blind studies and baseline studies and make it a, you know, a $200,000 thing? And you, you were the first person I remember saying, well, let's try, why don't we just see what the town thinks about it? Let's... Oh, okay. Well, David, I think you're going to have to no hold your um, fire for uh, for the senator. How exciting! Yay!
Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is my honor to provide a Hoosier welcome and to introduce United States Senator Todd Young of Indiana. A fifth-generation Hoosier, uh, Senator Young previously was the U.S. Representative for the 9th District of Indiana. Before running for Congress, he worked in a private law practice in Indiana and was a management consultant advising public and private organizations. He also held positions at the Heritage Foundation and as a legislative, legislative assistant in the Senate. Senator Young graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with honors and accepted a commission in the United States Marine Corps, where he served as an intelligence officer. Following a decade of military service, Senator Young was honorably discharged as a captain and spent a year in England, earning an M.A. from the School of Advanced Study in London. He also earned an M.B.A. with a concentration in economics from the University of Chicago, and I am pleased to say he is an alumnus of Indiana University, where he earned his J.D. Senator Young serves on the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, where he chairs the Subcommittee on Multilateral International Development, Multilateral Institutions, and International Economic, Energy, and Environmental Policy. Its responsibilities include oversight of U.S. multilateral international development policy and multilateral foreign assistance. Senator, earlier we touched on Indiana's distinguished history of providing bipartisan international leadership to leaders such as former U.N. Food Program Executive Director Jim Morris, Congressman Lee Hamilton, and Senator Richard Luger. You two are part of the legacy of Hoosier international leadership, and we thank you. We appreciate that you are able to be with us to share your perspective on global philanthropy and international development. Please join me in welcoming Senator Young. Thanks so much. Well, it really is my privilege uh, to be invited here today before this uh, distinguished group. Uh, it's especially my privilege to be here with my friends from IU uh, in attendance. And uh, yes, you, you can applaud that. Uh, <laughs> And I am well aware of uh, how the uh, historical roots of the Hudson Institute run through the uh, very fine soil of the state of Indiana. So I, I take pride in that. So I think it's fitting uh, that on multiple counts, um, you have the senator from the state of Indiana here today. I'm, I'm privileged to be here. Um, Dr. Weinstein, Carol Edelman, Amir Pasek, Una Osali, uh, thank you all for your leadership. Uh, and your important work. I want to congratulate the Center for Global Prosperity at the Hudson, Hudson Institute for your work to help us better understand the sources and magnitude of private giving for the developing world. Your examination of the barriers and incentives for individuals and organizations to donate money and donate time to worthy causes uh, worldwide has provided invaluable uh, and necessary insight that informs and guides policy. Perhaps the best indication of the quality of the program, and I would say the wisdom of its leaders, is that you chose IU's Lilly Family School of Philanthropy <laughs> to carry forward your good work and uh, to hand over these two very important indices of global philanthropy. The Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances and the Index of Philanthropic Freedom. Now, we Hoosiers are a very proud people. We're proud of IU's long-standing commitment to international engagement and to philanthropy. I say that not just as an IU graduate, uh, but as a resident of Bloomington, Indiana, and uh, as someone who's uh, spent quite a bit of time over at the School of Philanthropy. IU's Lilly Family School is the world's first school dedicated to research and teaching about philanthropy. IU was among the first universities in the nation to introduce philanthropy as a formal field of study. It created the Philanthropic Studies uh, program and launched the world's first PhD program in the field. The Lilly School is acknowledged nationally and internationally for its phil philanthropy research, and its research, of course, sets the standard for the field. These reports being transferred to IU are important barometers of global philanthropy and development. So establishing a permanent home for them is very important. We will ensure that they continue to expand and inform our understanding of the vital role that private action, as opposed to just government action, plays in making the world a better place. Now, Indiana is a basketball-crazed state. I've spent almost my, my entire life in the state of Indiana. We understand what it means to have reliable hints. So I'm here to assure you uh, that these indices will be in very reliable hands. 
with Hoosiers. Now, on a more serious note, I'd like to speak with you about the enduring value and importance of foreign aid, as well as the role of philanthropy and remittances in doing good around the world. As you may know, the value and return on investment for U.S. foreign aid and funding for international programs are under intense scrutiny. Reportedly, the administration is seeking deep State Department and USAID funding cuts. Many Americans continue to think this is okay, and that's natural because they believe that our government spends an enormous percentage of our budget on foreign aid to countries that don't like us very much. The Kaiser Family Foundation conducted a survey recently examining exactly what percentage of the federal budget Americans thought went to foreign aid. Cue the laughter. This is an educated group. You may well be aware that respondents believe that 26% of the federal budget went to foreign aid. 26%. Now, all of us know that it's far less than that. In fact, it's less than 1% less than 1% of our overall budget. And think of all the value we get for that investment. Well, just days ago, 121 former U.S. generals and admirals, all three and four stars, sent a letter to the leadership in Congress opposing the proposed cuts to state and to USAID. These generals and admirals wrote, the State Department, USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, Peace Corps, and other development agencies are critical to preventing conflict and reducing the need to put our men and women in uniform in harm's way. I couldn't agree more. Our now Secretary of Defense, Mattis, perhaps said it best and characteristically, said it most colorfully when he said, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition. Now, as a former Marine Corps intel officer, I understand the importance of foreign aid to our national security. I understand the importance of soft power as we look to exercise power worldwide. And I believe that the State Department and USAID should be fully funded. Just last week, I joined with Senators Carbon, Rubio, and Shaheen to express our concern to the Director of the Office of Management and Budget about the administration's reported plan to pursue deep cuts to America's international affairs spending, which includes funding for state and USAID. We stated in our letter, a well-designed international affairs budget not only furthers the universal human rights and democratic principles that Americans cherish, but these investments also further America's economic and national security interests. Well-designed and closely monitored foreign affairs programs can improve governance, reduce corruption, promote development, combat human trafficking, build partner capacity, eradicate disease, prevent conflict, and much more. If we underfund and undercut for deployed foreign affairs and foreign assistance programs as tools to our national security strategy, we will ultimately increase the risks to Americans. However, as the 2016 Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances makes clear, government-funded foreign aid programs are only part of the picture. As important as government development funding is, the work of CGP demonstrates that if we focus on government development sources alone, we only see a fraction of the real picture. The 26 Index of Global Philanthropy and Remittances tells us that 84% of all donors' total economic engagement with the developing world is through private financial flows, with only 16% from government aid. This policymaker was entirely unaware that it was that imbalanced until I read this report from the index. That's the power of the index. Yeah. So roughly 85% comes from private sources. Shouldn't we be doing all we can to educate the broader public about the importances of global philanthropy and remittances? I think we should. In the case of the United States, the index demonstrates that the official development assistance is dwarfed by philanthropy and remittances. The index also demonstrates what many of us already know. 
Corporations, nonprofits, churches, universities, families, individuals play an enormous role in global relief and development efforts. CBG, CGP's, my apologies, uh, analysis also revealed other important trends in global philanthropy. And some of these trends uh, include increasing use of crowdsourcing, the increasing prevalence of younger donors, the growth of the global middle class, persistence of barriers to private giving, and so on. If we're going to harness the full potential of philanthropy and remittances to help address the major humanitarian and development crises of our time, we have to understand these trends better and do all we can to identify and reduce barriers to legitimate philanthropy and remittances. Along with conducting assertive oversight of the Department of State and USAID and seeking reform where appropriate for official development assistance, if we're really serious about addressing the major humanitarian and development challenges of our time, addressing these barriers to legitimate philanthropy and remittances is one of the best things we can do. So as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, in addition to conducting assertive oversight of state and USAID, I'm committed to learning more and making sure that uh, we do just that that we open up the window of opportunity uh, for more monies to be sent where they're needed most. Harnessing the full potential of government and private giving is not only a moral imperative, though it is that, it's a national security imperative. As former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice so eloquently put it, for the United States, supporting international development is more than just an expression of our compassion. It's a vital investment in the free, prosperous, and peaceful international order that, that fundamentally serves our national interest. So congratulations again uh, to all of those in attendance. Uh, I'm here to celebrate with the Center for Global Prosperity, with Indiana University's Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. I look forward to working with both of you in the future to further these important initiatives, and I'm so thankful that you have me here today. Choose your seat. Great. Well, Senator, I want to thank you for those uh, extraordinarily eloquent remarks on the not only the importance of official U.S. development assistance and the role that it plays in preventing broader conflict throughout the world, but also uh, the role that private development assistance plays, how critical it is for the United States and for others. As we were chatting in the green room, I noted, uh, told you that we had uh, excellent relations with uh, the three previous men who held your seat, and we're absolutely delighted to have you down here. I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'll Please. turn over to the audience. One of the, uh, in your remarks, you talked uh, a number of reasons why Indiana University's Lilly Family School of Philanthropy is so well positioned to take responsibility for the indices going forward. I'm just wondering, uh, obviously you had spent some time down there teaching at SPIA, and you graduated from the Robert McKinney School of Law, former Hudson Institute trustee. Let me throw another plug in there for guys <laughs> Indiana. Additional thoughts on why IU is such a, a great fit for the indices. So we have a dual mandate as, as members of, of the House or the Senate. Uh, on one hand, we're supposed to be advocates for our own state, but on the other hand, uh, we're supposed to more broadly try and affect good public policy, irrespective of where we're from. Uh, very rarely do I have any difficulty reconciling uh, those two missions. I certainly don't here. Because I think objectively, uh, the Lilly Family School uh, is, is the best school of philanthropy in the world. I've, I've consulted with others on this fact. I think in this particular case, um, the Lilly School has ac access to a network of scholars, of donors, of partners, uh, of alumni and alumnae uh, that they can draw upon uh, to uh, further the scholarship in this area. Uh, and uh, that's something important to leverage. Also, uh, their work in the domestic field of philanthropy uh, is unparalleled. Uh, the annual publish, uh, uh, publication, Giving USA, is, is sort of the gold standard with respect to 
um, you know, assessing uh, the world of philanthropy. So uh, I expect no less moving forward with respect to the handling of the indices. Hear, hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In your remarks, you also talked about the uh, importance of addressing barriers to le legitimate philanthropy and remittances. What are some of these barriers? Why are they there? And what can we do? What can you do? What can be done to bring these barriers down? So there, you might say there, there's a few different types of, of, of barriers. So one are, are just uh, currency barriers, uh, the, the currency controls that uh, some countries place in the amount of currency that can be sent out of a given country. And um, that's, that's pretty thorny to deal with. Um, that, that involves um, dealing with the foreign government. Uh, there's issues of sovereignty there. That's probably not our lowest hanging fruit. But then we have a series of laws that are uh, passed, many of them passed after 9-11, to deal with the illicit transfer of funds. It was important that we enacted a number of these laws. Um, but some of them overshot, uh, and so we need to take a look at those, and, and wherever we've uh, gone too far, uh, we need to refine those laws. And, and the lawmaking process, I've learned since I've been in Congress, is really an iterative process. Rarely do you get it completely right. Uh, you do the best you can. <laughs> you do the best you can, and then you consult with stakeholders, and iteratively, over a period of time, you uh, improve the laws you have, and sometimes circumstances change, and you need to improve them again. And, and so um, we'll do that with respect to these uh, illicit transfer of fund uh, laws, or design, uh, laws that are designed to prevent the illicit transfer of funds. And then you have this final category of laws that are purportedly designed to address the illicit transfer of funds or purportedly designed to uh, increase security of a given country. And we know this, this is a real problem uh, because uh, the, the, one of the 2015 indices tells us it is uh, the index of, of uh, philanthropic freedom. Uh, I think Turkey, Russia, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, were cited in particular as violators. Malaysia, uh, they've, they've erected laws under the veil of uh, ensuring domestic tranquility when, in fact, what they're really trying to do is stifle civil society, stifle any uh, sort of uh, legitimate non-governmental uh, organization that might occur within a, uh, an economy, within a culture. Uh, we know here in the United States how important our civil society is uh, to keep our government in check. And um, so we're gonna, just going to have to stay vigilant in our diplomacy to make sure that, uh, uh, to, that uh, uh, we seek some change in these areas. Of course, informed by the best facts available. And that's where the indices come in. Yeah. Excellent. Let me ask you a quick follow-up on the, the part you mentioned about the, the iterative process on the, in the post-9-11 oh, sure. regs. Do you, do you see any movement in this Congress on these kind of laws or any possibility for movement, or is that something that's... I do. I, I see a real possibility uh, for movement. I, I think, you know, uh, as legislators like myself learn more about this topic, we have the opportunity to uh, bring certain facts to light. Uh, in public settings, uh, through public hearings on the Foreign Relations Committee. There may be opportunities to write columns mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the importance of this topic and, and some of the barriers to increasing uh, philanthropic aid and remittances uh, where they're most needed. So um, uh, it's my intention to share some of what I learned with my colleagues and, and, and collectively, hopefully we can affect some positive change. Let me ask you one last question before we turn it over to the audience. I know your time is a bit limited. Uh, talking about your time in Congress, and now you're, you've moved over to the Senate side, and you've, you've mentioned moving over to the Foreign Relations Committee and the change of portfolio that you have and, and the great responsibilities you have as chairing the subcommittee. You talked about the need uh, for more assertive oversight of the Department of State and uh, USAID, uh, and I'm wondering government being an iterative process, as you mentioned, uh, how you, what your sense is, have you, you've been there now only for, obviously, for just a few months, you know, going on, completed now two months in the Senate, where do you see ways that oversight can be improved? 
There's not enough time here. Um, I, <laughs> and I have only been here a, a short uh, period of time, but um, look, when I found out that it's been at least a decade since an authorization bill was last passed dealing with the State Department, um, I, I became very troubled because when you're really not authorizing, you're not legislating, you are, you're performing oversight. Uh, occasionally you'll be able to, to, uh, to piggyback um, some legislation that reforms the State Department or USAID um, on, on another piece of legislation, say the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, but it becomes very difficult to fundamentally transform an agency. Um, so um, just knowing that, I have real concerns uh, about uh, how the State Department operates, how USAID operates. I don't need to know the particulars yet. Mm -hmm. uh, if I heard that any corporation, uh, multinational corporation, had not fundamentally transformed its internal organization structure or its operations in a decade, that would be a sinking corporation. Okay? So um, it, I, I do want to project some humility here. I'm the new guy. I have a lot to learn, but that really troubles me. I see some low-hanging fruit. So we have the benefit of a number of outside groups as well as the Government Accountability Office. And uh, the Government Accountability Office recently put forward a couple of hundred recommendations, actually within the last several years, uh, to State Department, uh, which have not been implemented. So uh, we authored in our office some early legislation just to uh, ensure that the State Department either makes those changes with a timeline to affecting those changes uh, delivered to Congress in short order or explains to the Congress of the United States why it's not enacting these simple good government changes because if people are going to dare I say regain faith uh, in foreign aid uh, then they need to make sure that every dollar they spend uh, is, is really being spent most effectively. And so I think that's the first step mm -hmm. um, to uh, improving things at state and USAID. And so I, we, we've got pretty broad bipartisan support, and, and um, I'm confident that we'll get that bill passed. It's a first step, but it's an important one. Yeah. Indeed, great. Let's, let's turn it over to the audience for questions. Let me remind everybody to state a question not make a speech, to uh, be eloquent and brief, like as Senator Young has been. And that was very kind of you. I, uh, <laughs> well, you, you mentioned your humility. I should also praise you for humility, an all too rare quality, especially on this avenue. Uh, sure, let's go. Yes, sir. Senator, you have an MBA in Chicago. Yes. Uh, I've been to, I teach at Georgetown Business School, and I've been to 40 business schools in Africa. Uh, weak management, in my judgment, and it's shared by others, is a major barrier, maybe the major barrier. So I ask you, uh, in the position you're in, to do whatever you can to improve business schools and management education in the poorest countries. And this, the region of Africa is my main concern, but I think it's true in Latin America and, and elsewhere as well. What an interesting request to make of me and very well received no really it's, it's very thoughtful um, and um, yes please let me um, let me give more consideration to um, how we might do that we, you and I can dialogue about that but uh, it might be a way uh, thematically consistent with what we're talking about here to take elements of, 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 of civil society not all these institutions are governmental, many are. Um, many people who, who graduate from these institutions end up starting their own organizations, right? Uh, uh, or, or growing existing ones. So um, I think maybe that's an unexplored area. So yeah, let's, let's continue the dialogue. Thank you. I should, I should add, last week we had the Nigerian uh, Minister of Finance uh, Okachuka and Alame, who spoke here, and he was a Baker Scholar at Harvard Business School. He'd originally began as a physician, and when he was uh, at Harvard Business School, he then became interested in using the private sector as a means to transform his uh, country, and it's a uh, fascinating individual. We'll have to get you together and introduce him to the Lilly School. Yeah. Thank you. Randy Teft with World Vision. So I'm thinking of uh, President Trump saying on the campaign trail, 
uh, we should stop aid to countries that hate us. But if he were here today, he might well think, rather than stop aid, we should condition aid to countries that hate or act like they hate their civil societies or their philanthropies, their host country, in the host country philanthropies. These are the policies that we've just heard about. How do we get there? And one might argue, if you've been watching aid closely, the Obama administration in many ways failed by empowering, by considering local ownership in foreign assistance to be about government uh, control or government ownership rather than the ownership of the whole society. When foreign aid is delivered to a host country, it should be civil society that owns the development objectives and also has ownership of the aid. But there was a move toward uh, a more government-centric approach. So in a way, it's a political moment for a Trump administration or a Republican Congress to differentiate from the past administration's policies and say, here's how we get it right. How do we get there to a favorable view of aid with a policy approach that could be distinctive and maybe set apart the new administration? It's a big, wacky question. I, so. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, my, my answer will, will not be um, larded with concrete examples being uh, fairly new to this terrain, but um, perhaps I can analyze and answer your question through analogy. Um, I spent the last six years serving the House of Representatives. Uh, my, my primary focus, uh, the, at least the policy area I'm, I was proudest of, was coming up with creative ways to serve those on the margins of society. Uh, we have roughly, now, now bear with me here. You're going to be wa marching down the aisle with me uh, here in a second. But uh, yeah. we, have roughly, we have roughly 80 or so human um, human resources uh, programs or welfare programs uh, in this at the federal level of government, depending upon how you count them. Out of those 80 programs, only 10 has e have ever been rigorously studied using uh, randomized controlled trial across multiple sites. That's the gold standard of evaluation. 10 out of 80 have been rigorously studied. One has maybe been found to work. That's early head start and subject to a lot of debate as, of, you know, as to whether it works well or not. So let's say one, okay? For me, it's, it, 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 I, I, it's not a surprise that the American people and their collective wisdom have lost faith in the welfare state. That's not to say they don't care about people who are poor. It's also not to suggest that some of the money we throw uh, towards uh, depressed communities and individuals um, doesn't benefit those people. But if we can start investing in interventions that civil society uh, has been investing in for some time that have a proven efficacy, we can restore hope in our ability as a government um, to actually improve lives. And we will build public support for investing in depressed communities and, and uh, people that find themselves in unfortunate circumstances. So I think the same thing probably applies at the international level. We now have a more robust international NGO presence uh, than at any time in, in human history, right? Uh, they are developing uh, with increasing regularity uh, a, a, a massive evidence base of what works. You can conduct a randomized controlled trial for under $100,000 now, right? And so with this body of evidence growing, we ought to be shifting from investing in government-centric interventions to, this is what my instincts tell me. I am open to intelligent counterargument on any of this, but probably ought to be shifting to things that are proven to work in the non-governmental realm, and government should be very rigorously overseeing those activities. So um, that, that's my first thought of, of uh, how we'd approach this. Yeah. Time for one more question. And that's why international philanthropy is so important, <laughs> right? Last question over here. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on how a conception of philanthropic freedom often applied to uh, countries uh, that we assume to be unfree can be directed inwards? Uh, in the last couple of weeks, there's been a number of uh, commentary in the nonprofit sector uh, here expressing concern about a number of uh, legislative moves and general uh, attitudes towards civil society. So how can the concept of, of philanthropic freedom um, be internalized, and how can it shape our own understanding of our own uh, voluntary sector? 
Did I, did I mention any hard questions need to be submitted by email? <laughs> hard copy, so three weeks in yeah. advance. Actually, it's, it's, that's not a hard question. It's a very good question. Um, I mean, I think the same principles ought to apply, right? Uh, that that were uh, that ought to not only apply, but we ought to have a higher standard for ourselves because Americans deserve better. Okay, I'm going to show my parochial uh, side here. Americans deserve better. So. Um, to the extent any barriers exist uh, to philanthropic freedom, uh, to the extent we are constraining a robust civil society here in the United States of, of, of America, uh, I even feel more, uh, a greater conviction uh, to get things right. Uh, I'm open to specifics. If you have them or if others have them, I, I, I invite you to contact our office and tell us legislatively what we can do or what regulations need to be changed or what needs to be said. Uh, it's it's uh, sometimes difficult to catch every tweet or Facebook post uh, or utterance uh, in this modern era. So thank you for your question. Yeah. Well, Senator, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us on this very uh, important occasion for us, for the uh, for colleague and friend Carol Edelman, for the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. We really... We know how busy your schedule is, and it's, it's wonderful to have someone who pays attention to this kind of research, who knows what to do with it, uh, coming to play such a uh, prominent role on the uh, Foreign Relations Committee as these critical issues are going to be debated. So we thank you for your time here and for your service more broadly. So thank Thanks you. for your hospitality. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Is this? Oh, yeah. mind if we take if we let Dennis if any any questions to Dennis um, or, or anybody else we'll do that for about 10 minutes and then David you'll give us your your, your government perspective um, questions okay in the back yes the gentleman uh, uh, thank you uh, the senator raised an interesting point uh, uh, implicitly or explicitly talking about a relative uh, uh, efficiency of private versus public uh, philanthropy. And I know, you know, like, and I'm just wondering what the experience has been, for instance, in the feedback group of testing, of testing various approaches, both governmental and private, and, you know, and whether or not there is this implicit assumption among some that government actions are not as efficient as private actions. Yeah, we'll have Dave, but, but Dennis has to leave in 10 minutes. So, yeah, Dennis, yeah, do you want to... Yeah, I'm sorry, I have a child care issue. Which, <laughs> speaking of feedback, feedback from a nine-year-old, <laughs> very vocal, and <laughs> got to respond. So, um, that's a great question. And one, one thing I think I've learned along the way is, uh, you know, American society and the economy, to the extent it's successful, is it's because it has 
an extraordinary interplay between government, civil society, and the private sector. And it's not all one, and it's not all the other. It's some mix of these things, each of which brings something to bear. And we've all been the beneficiaries of this system um, that uh, fluidly allocates uh, resources among them. So if there's one message not to take away from Carol's work or my work, it's that government aid programs are bad inherently. Uh, I think what we're reacting to is, in the past, aid, and a lot of philanthropy as well, is highly centralized. Decisions made by just a few people. And so at the margin, we're looking for ways to increase access uh, to, uh, to other forms of finance and other ideas. And also to create mechanisms so the best ideas can win. And the ideas that don't work fall by the wayside, whether they be in the public sector or, or the private sector. So I, I, I was struck by the senator's re I gotta say, I was struck by the senator's reasonableness when he spoke. Uh, and no, in this political environment, it's, it's reassuring. And it's a hats off again to Carol and, and, and to Ken A and to Ken W and Hudson for hosting, you know, reasonable discussions on this. It's a balance. It's not all one thing or the exactly. other. Exactly. So. Yeah. Oh, exactly. So, good. So, David, give us your, well, it, let's do one more question and then David's going to give us his thoughts from, yes, right there. Hey, good evening, uh, Jason Marshall, George Washington University. Um, the senator spoke a lot about how development is being elevated alongside uh, defense and diplomacy as a tool for U.S. Uh, foreign policy and achieving some of our goals overseas. Uh, with the current administration, we're seeing that uh, there's proposed deep cuts to some of our bilateral aid organizations, and then through your studies, we're seeing an increase in uh, private uh, and philanthropic uh, aid overseas. Uh, but do you see the potential for private capital flows uh, substituting some of the uh, maybe more foreign policy objectives that official development assistance is, has the ability to achieve um, as we see the rates decrease? You know, I think the biggest, uh, one, one thing that several people raised, which I've always been struck by in terms of the effectiveness of aid is it's really about people. Uh, and it was a question about allocating aid away from enemies or whatever. And I was thinking about in my life the, the number of people I have met who are senior government officials, whether they be a uh, finance minister from Nigeria or Liberia or wherever, or Indonesia where I worked a lot. Um, and it comes down to individuals. And in many cases, those individuals will reach through the Ford Foundation or a private philanthropic or, or organization or World Vision or others. And in other cases, they came through USAID or USIA programs. Um, some can be coordinated through the private sector, but some, I, I, I've, at the risk of being partisan, I'm with the senator on that. It's, I'd be very, very careful about making deep cuts because some of the things that require large programs, and as frustrated as we get with some of these large programs, still they're not replaceable by um, uh, the, the private voluntary organizations completely. So I, 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 I'm with the senator on that one. You've got to be careful about too rapid and too radical changes. Make them slowly over time. Bring them about through insight and analysis the way people on the panel have been doing and Carol and, and uh, others here at Hudson have been leading. I think we'll see over time, just like we saw in the chart, that, you know, as countries develop, we'll see the private sector coming in. Um, but I think there, the strong role for government is in humanitarian aid crises and in post-conflict situations where we have, we have to send our, you know, um, um, our ships out so that helicopters can fly in and help countries and look at the Ebola crisis. You know, it was our military and CDC there. You know, so there are certain things that really um, I'm a big fan of government aid on. Yeah. And there's just certain other ones that will, I think, naturally get replaced as, as countries develop. So, um, and I don't, I doubt if we will get those strong, you know, I think that that's kind of the first bid. <laughs> And I think it'll be a long bargaining process. And there was quite a strong bipartisan reaction to it. So, you know, I think, I, I don't think that that will be as, as, as deep 
as it sounds, but but we'll see, and I'm sure that you know the Congress will come forth and say what they want to do. Good question. I'm sorry. I'm mean, speaking of reasonable. You're about to hear uh, from one of the most reasonable organizations out there that's done have been such a force for for good and reasonableness. And I really apologize that I have to. Say that's that. okay, Janice. Thank but you thanks, so much. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. 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 Good. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. And David, you know, since we don't really have a new aid administrator, we don't have new, you know, a, a, a strategy, it seems like, for our government aid yet. I'm sure, sure someone's working on it. Um, I think it'll be great to hear from David because he's going to come at us with, okay, what can, what would be a good government strategy to help encourage and not squash or, you know, or, or hurt philanthropy, but what, what would that strategy be? And I think Canada is doing it, um, obviously, the, with all the work you're doing in public-private partnerships. And they funded us to help emerging economies, all the South Africa's, Brazil's, India's, China's, to develop the research skills to see what was going on in their countries. And we now have 11 that are very excited about continuing, and Indiana will increase that as well. So, David, let's let's hear from you. We get some good guidance for our new government, maybe for you know well, this is being televised. Much. So, so um, no, I feel <laughs> like I'm watched. standing between the reception. So you, I'll try and and you are explain these briefly. <laughs> um, but thanks so much for uh, to the Hudson and for Carol for having me here. Um, it's been a really a pleasant and pleasurable journey to be working with Carol. Um, very thoughtful partner, Hudson, and, and it's nice because, you know, IDRC came and tried to put forward some new ideas, and, and Carol was very receptive, as was Hudson, and I think the inclusion of the emerging economies into the index is a good example. And um, so, anyways, thank you very much. Um, so, as the sole Canadian, I think, up here today, let me just quickly tell you very briefly where I, I'm situated. So the International Development Research Center is a very small organization in Canada. It's what we call a crown corporation. And um, so we're part of uh, the federal government. And in fact, we're part of the international assistance envelope, but we're a very small player. Um, and if you asked any Canadian, um, do you know who IDRC is? I'm sure that they would say no. Um, we are largely domestically invisible, but outside of, of the Canadian context, actually, I think IDRC is quite well known, which is which is nice. And we come from actually the Lester Pearson, former Prime Minister Trudeau era, um, and now we're under under the son of, of, of that Prime Minister. So interesting times. Um, so let me just start with, very quickly with the story. I mean, why why am I personally interested in these in these issues? What got me? to work with Carol and to support some thinking in this area. Um, there are a number of different inflection points, but one in particular was about five years ago, or maybe longer, I was in Jakarta, Indonesia, and I was there with a whole host of different bilateral donors and your typical OECD doc donors. And um, I spent the day uh, in one of their, if anyone has been there, the opulent malls that seem to be everywhere there. And there was, there was people, you know, with more bags than I've ever seen shopping in my life. I mean, it was just in, the, the opulence and the wealth, at least in some pockets, were, was remarkable. And then I went to a dinner and um, one of the line ministers, um, I think it was education, uh, was there. And it was interesting because she was talking about all the different problems that they're dealing with in Indonesia, on education, on health, I mean, on all the different dimensions that we know. And then we got, uh, she, she started to really shame us as a group and, and got quite vocal about why are you retreating? Aid levels are going down. Um, you, you should not be, uh, diverting your attention to Africa or wherever else it is. I mean, we have real needs in this country. For me, it was a real interesting moment because I thought, wow, the, the, the number of high net worth individuals that have been, that have been spawned in that country, the welfare, yes, they have inequality, but they're not, they weren't even turning their attention in any way to think about, well, how might we, leverage this new wealth? How might we do it for the public good? How might we build an enabling environment that would allow? That wasn't part of the conversation. That wasn't part of the discourse at all. And I thought to myself, wow. And I've been seeing this in many different uh, developing country contexts. And so I really strongly um, believe that it's important for us to do the research to support it from an analytical and rigorous perspective, 
a really, it's a policy push. It's a real, um, there are building blocks that are just missing in so many countries. And until we build that capacity, we get it onto the political agendas, then it's going to be very difficult for uh, philanthropy to be unleashed, for it to really make a contribution to society. So that's partly why, um, you know, I, I said to Carol when I first met her, might we consider thinking about um, starting to measure um, the economic engagement of some of the emerging economies? And we started with four, and then we expanded it out to, to I think it was 11? In, in 11. Yeah, 11. And, and hopefully we'll expand it out more when we move to Indiana. Um, so, so at IDRC, I, I have the, the privilege of sitting in an interesting job. I, am, I can support research, and that's what we do as an organization, and this is a great example of it. But I also am able to connect it to what we as a governmental agency are doing strategically and how we're going out there and engaging and working in the world. And, um, and I can take a very long, long-term horizon on looking at and examining how this world is changing. And there's been lots of discussion with my fellow panelists and others that it's a dynamic world. We're seeing all sorts of um, fantastic changes and, and the kind of economic engagements that are going on um, are, are nothing like we've seen in the past. And, and um, I think governments are beginning to um, think about ways in which they can modernize, innovate, or change the ways in which they operate. And I think we have to because if we stick to the old norms and, and the ways in which um, development has been happening for many decades, we're going to very quickly become irrelevant. And so, um, and so that's where I, I, I connect this type of research to building the field, to unleashing new actors that will become our partners. And if they're not already our partners, they, it will down the line be partners that we as IDRC and and other development agencies can work with and need to work with, and they will be the domestic sources of, of, um, of, of financing and, and resources for the type of partners that we're supporting around the world. Um, so just to give you one example in practice, um, we at IDRC are recently started to work um, with the Carlos Slim Foundation. And uh, so in Mexico and in Central America, um, particularly that so-called Northern Triangular, uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, as probably many of you are aware, um, they're facing such deep public security crisis with homicide rates that are so high, highest globally. And the lack of economic opportunities and the extreme high unemployment rates deeply affect young people, particularly youth at risk uh, of violence and organized crime. So together um, with the Carlos Slim Foundation, we're creating a platform that seeks to address the above challenges by building the capacities of civil servants as well as leaders of civil society and, and, and very importantly, the youth organizations. And together we'll bring the best experts, we'll gather knowledge, promising practices, intervention models, methodologies, and public policies to strengthen youth citizen security and promote economic inclusion of young people at risk in Mexico. So that's just an example of, for us, this is a philanthropic foundation, not a new one, but still a new actor, and we're trying to find ways to work with them, and, uh, and that's that connection to the, the operational one. It's not easy to do, um, and that could be its own panel, but I won't get into that. Um, so moving forward, uh, I, I am so delighted that the two index indexes are transitioning to the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at the University of Indiana. Like the senator said, I know this public good will be in excellent hands. Um, there, is, there is no doubt a need for leadership in the field of global philanthropic research, um, particularly given this limited number of institutions capable of conducting this research and advancing agendas in the global south. So, and that has been one of the most challenging aspect of the research on philanthropy uh, throughout this project has been in emerging economies was finding those appropriate institutions to partner with on the research. There is, in my opinion, a very clear capacity gap. And I see this as a long-term issue that merits our support to help build this field. Um, for whether it be on the measurement side or building the enabling side, 
countries will undoubtedly be better served if they can formulate policies and supportive environments that allow for unfettered institutional philanthropic giving. So I'll end there. Great. Thank you, David. And you really are the – thank you so much. IDRC has really been a leader in, in building local capacity and creating researchers. We, you know, you provided us the funds that we could then give to them and work with, and they've come up and they love it, and they're very excited about it. So you'll – and this is just such a natural fit for Indiana. We're excited. So let's just take maybe one one more question or so. Yes. Um, yeah, right there. Uh huh. Or, well, we can take two then if there's another. Go right ahead. And then we have a little ceremony, which will take two minutes. Yeah, I'll be quick. Rick O'Sullivan, Change Management Solutions. This is meant for targeted Doug, but give it to everyone. We constantly position civil society and development as the watchdog over government, but yet. De Tocqueville described um, uh, democracy in America as uh, civil society was our, our free school of democracy, not because they lobbied, but because they governed. And I think even most Americans would be surprised what percentage of the U.S. economy is self-regulated. But we do not even mention that. And so when you talk about closing government uh, civil society space, to what degree do you think this emphasis on watchdog and confrontation is from the development community could be responsible. If we continually describe civil society as a Socratic gadfly, should we be surprised that it eventually reaches Socrates' end? Mm. God. Thank you. <clears throat> Some years ago, there was this sense that closing space was only around the issue of democracy and human rights groups. And it turned out simply not to be true. I mentioned this issue of development effectiveness. We are finding now, and our friends who work in the humanitarian assistance community feel this firsthand, that governments are actually limiting space for groups that are working on humanitarian assistance, working on traditional issues of development, the environment. It's very interesting, India recently put out a list of organizations that they have on their banking watch list. And almost none of the organizations are democracy or human rights groups. They're development groups. They're faith-based organizations. They were quite nervous about faith-based organizations. The vast majority of them were faith-based. What's also interesting is almost none of them are American. There's a sense, well, it must be about those pesky American human rights groups. But it's groups like the uh, DENIDA, the Danish International Development Assistance Agency, it was court aid. It was groups like that. So I think, in fact, what we're seeing now is that it is a phenomenon that's covering the sector writ large and is not simply a response to governments being nervous about watchdog and NGOs or advocacy groups, but it's much more about this paternalistic, father-knows-best approach where we know what people should be doing, how they should be spending their resources better than the people themselves know. Good, thank you. That's a very concise thing. Let's take one last question here. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for the report. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And the talk and the panel. Um, I wondered how you're defining private capital flows and why it's included in a report on philanthropy. And sure. who, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we wanted to, it's definitely the main thrust because it's the original research brings us philanthropy and remittances because we pulled that together from the World Bank. And government aid, of course, is available through the OECD. We wanted to, in addition to global philanthropy and remittances, show what a country's total engagement was with the developing world. So we didn't feel that it made sense to just have those you know, global philanthropy and remittances and then ODA, what, let's put the fourth flow in there just to show it. But you're right. I mean, technically, we should probably say, you know, index of global ph philanthropy, remittances, <laughs> you know, government aid and private investment capital. Because it makes more sense to look at, you know, not just to take one flow and say that is the measure of a country's generosity, makes sense to 
let's see what's happening overall. So that's why we did it, yeah. I'm going to take one from Barb Spann, who is from Western Union. We've been talking a lot about remittances, and then, then, we, then we will stop. So welcome, Barb. Thank you. I promise to be brief. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Hudson Institute and for you, Dr. Edelman, for the amazing breakthroughs that you have you. made over the past decade with this study. It truly, truly has been phenomenal. And since we're heading into a tr transition, I will leave you with a rhetorical question uh, coming from, um, and this is one uh, for thinking for the future, coming from the remittance industry. You know, Western Union, we get calls uh, all the time from development organizations, aid agencies, NGOs, and others. And they ask about the remittance flows uh, to certain areas. Um, and the purpose for asking is different from each of these organizations at different times. Uh, for example, what are the flows from into this one area? Because we're trying to determine as an aid agency or development organization, if remittance flows are strong, if we can devote our limited dollars mm. in official development assistance or our aid to another purpose, mm. because remittances are covering what we would do. And other organizations say, well, if remittance flows are coming into this area, is that a, perhaps a harbinger of a growing or emerging issue that we have to focus on and maybe focus our development aid? Um, or is that an indicator of there are pathways to get an aid where previously there were barriers um, because you're able to get funds in there? Mm -hmm. So there are always different reasons for asking. So in this transition, my rhetorical question is, uh, could we possibly incorporate in the future um, some of these varying reasons coming from official development agencies, NGOs, and others to try to identify um, their purposes uh, for asking about these different flows. So maybe we could have some consolidation of uh, getting the right flows to the right place and not uh, erroneously uh, or um, uh, not for the wrong reasons, replacing one flow with another or making assumptions about why a flow is going in one direction uh, or another and really understand from the perspective of these agencies. That's my rhetorical question. And thank you again and congratulations. Well, thank you, Barb. And you have the remittances guru of IU here who I'm sure <laughs> loved your try. question. It's yeah, a complex can... question, but I think it's an important one. Um, I confronted this in my own research many years ago. Um, in studying remittances similar to philanthropy, there's a real need to unpack this very complex set of flows and understand the purposes and ultimately the destination. I think that is something we've done very successfully at IU, at the Lilly Family School with our Giving USA project, is to understand not just the sources of the flows, but the uses. Where do those funds go? With remittances, as I mentioned, I found out that it wasn't this homogeneous flow, that within this umbrella termed uh, remittances, the new development finance, whatever name you want to give it, we had sort of traditional family to family transfers, but we had straight investment, private capital flowing to investment projects that wasn't humanitarian in nature. And then we had these community development projects that were being funded by remittances. If you were just looking at one of those flows, you would miss the aggregate picture. Uh, but also in looking at the aggregate, it was important to actually go deeper. So I think it fits with our very understanding that when studying these complex topics, we need to bring all our resources to, be, to bear and our different <laughs> It's not enough to just look at one facet. We need to look at the broader picture. And I think that's what we plan to do in this next phase of the project, is not just look at the aggregate, but also to look at where are these flows going, what subsectors are receiving them, what flows are going to the environment versus education. And so going a bit deeper will help ultimately address the big development questions, the big sort of uh, well-being questions that we seek to answer in this next phase of the project. So I thank you for your insights, uh, but we hope to continue to partner with you and 
thinking about what are those new and emerging questions. Great, thank you. So Amir and Ken Weinstein, will you come up on the stage? And will everybody stand up? And Timo, could, would you come up here? Because we have two of our, our, our four largest donors here. And I think that the passing of, we'll, we'll take various photos here. This is our ceremony. <laughs> yeah. And no, you're, you were a partner. You were a very a big partner. So where do you want us? Um, let's see. Uh, I, I'll tell you what. Why don't you come over here? Yes. And then, Rachel, do you have our, the item? Okay. So we will pass this to, and Una, why don't you stand over by me? I'm here. Okay. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we have to pass to you. Okay, good. We'll catch them. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, Ken, would you like to read? Uh, move in, Ian, can you get uh, yeah, right, right everybody in? Okay, good. Hudson Institute, the Index of Global Philanthropy and Urbances 2016, presented to Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy on the occasion of the transfer of the Index of Global Philanthropy and Urbances from Hudson Institute to the world's leading school of philanthropy. March 7th, 2017, Washington, D.C. Right. Same wording on the occasion of the transfer of the Index of Philanthropic Freedom from Hudson Institute to the world's leading school of philanthropy. Here it is. So here you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> We know exactly where to put these. It'll be featured prominently. Oh, so you good, can come visit them. Okay, okay, you have a spot for it. Well, listen, I feel like we should be doing, you know, kumbaya. We <laughs> 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 won't. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you all for your help. And I know some of you had to, to leave because this has been a long session, but please come out. We have wonderful food and drinks for you. So join us, uh, and our panelists will join you for part of the reception. Great. Yeah. Congratulations again. Oh, my God. Thank you.